Hi there, I'm Christy Wilhelmy from Garden Nerd, and I've been hearing from a lot of people uh, questions like, what's eating my plant? What is this bug? That kind of thing. So I thought I'd take a moment to identify some of the common issues that you see on your plants. And if I don't get to yours, post a comment below and I'll make a part two. The first issue has a number of different appearances, but it looks something like this or this. These are leaf miners. Leaf miners burrow into the leaf and eat their way through between the back and the front. They're on the inside. And usually this is something you'll see on citrus trees as well. Now, the important thing to know is leaf miners are mostly cosmetic damage. You can just pick off the affected leaves and toss them in your compost bin or give them to your chickens or any other animal that likes to eat greens. There is an approach you can take if you do want to use a spray. It has to be something that has spinosad in it which penetrates the leaf and kills the insect. But I have to say, if you're going to spray on something that you actually eat, I wouldn't do that. Just pull off the affected leaves, toss them, and move on. The second bit of damage that you often see is, let's say you have lettuces and they're being nibbled at from the top. If the tips of your lettuces are destroyed or shaggy, then it could be one of two things. Well, it could be a couple of things. Uh, one, it could be deer. So usually they eat the whole head of lettuce down to nubbins. But if it's just gentle nibbling with maybe some bits lying around, that's probably rats. Rats are a problem in everyone's garden. You may think you don't have rats, but rats are everywhere and they are prey animals, so they repopulate really quickly faster than their predators do. So we actually set rat traps here at Garden Nerd headquarters. It's the only way to really deal with them properly. We set about 15 to 30 traps uh, for about four or five days with good bait like peanut butter or cheese and that reduces the population for a while. Now rats like to run along retaining walls and houses and boards and that kind of thing so when you set your rat trap put it perpendicular with the bait facing the wall or the edge and uh, check them every morning. If you do have pets that go outside during the day make sure you set the traps at night and deactivate them in the morning. Put a broom handle or a plush toy by your door so that you don't let Fluffy out in the morning before deactivating the rat traps. That's really important because animals are curious and you don't want to harm your pet that way. The next set of pests are on the bigger side. Rats are, you know, on the smaller side along with squirrels, but I've looped squirrels in with opossums and raccoons. Now, opossums and raccoons, they are mostly carnivores. If you find your plant dug up and set aside, that's because raccoons and opossums have been digging into your soil looking for grubs. They're not so much interested in your plants, they're interested in what's in your soil. So if you catch it early enough, you can just replant that crop that was pulled out, water it well, use a little kelp emulsion because kelp emulsion helps ease transplant shock. So mix a little kelp emulsion with some water and water it in and things will return to normal. If you need to protect your your plants from these marauders, you can put a, a layer of bird netting over things. Uh, I keep bird netting over my strawberry plants 100% of the time. And then that keeps the squirrels, the raccoons, and opossums away. And the rats to a degree, although they've learned how to like crawl underneath. So you have to secure the bird netting either to the ground all the way around with these things called U-pins or earth staples. They look like giant hairpins. Or you need to tie it to the bottom of the trunk of the tree if you're draping a fruit tree with it. Bird netting is one of the physical barriers that you can use to protect your plants from critters. The second physical barrier that I like to use to keep critters off my plants is called floating row cover or garden fabric. And floating row cover is available in a number of different thicknesses. You can have a light summer weight fabric or a heavy insulated fabric for winter. And what it does, not only does it allow sun and water to penetrate, but it keeps 
bugs from landing on your plants. So if you see holes in the middle of leaves, like in this picture of kale, you know you've got critters who are nibbling on the plants from the inside out. And that is usually something like a cabbage worm or an army worm or some other worm that's working its way around. And the only way they get there is if their eggs are laid on the undersides of the leaves. Some of these pupate in the soil, but that's another story. First of all, you need to identify the worm. So if you look at this picture, you can see a tiny little egg like this on the underside of your kale leaf that's the egg of a cabbage worm. And the cabbage worms will hatch and be the same color as the leaf, so they're really hard to find. But if you just sweep that egg off and inspect the undersides of leaves on a regular basis, like every other day, you can pull those cabbage worms off and toss them under your mighty shoe and they will uh, not be a problem anymore. So the floating row cover keeps the butterflies, the white moths actually, from laying their eggs on the leaves in the first place. They can't get contact, so they don't lay their eggs. So take these precautions with physical barriers like floating row cover and bird netting, and you'll solve a lot of the problems to begin with. I also use floating row cover when I first plant seeds. So if your seeds are being dug up by crows or other birds and being stolen and not germinating at all, try using floating row cover as protection when you first plant seeds. That works great. If you're growing squash, keep an eye out for striped or polka dotted green and white and black bugs. These are generally cucumber beetles and squash beetles. And while they are hanging around on your plants, they happen to carry a bacterial wilt with them and they are sucking insects. So when they start piercing the flesh of your, of your squash plants and sucking out the juices, they're actually delivering bacterial wilt to your plants. What it looks like when that happens is the plant is fine one day and then wilted the next and it doesn't recover. And you have to basically pull the plant and start over. This is where I come back to taking care of your soil food web. There are microbes in the soil and microarthropods and arthropods and worms and all kinds of stuff, fungi and bacteria, protozoa and nematodes, you've heard me talk about this before, that keep a balance on the predator to prey um, populations in soils and if you can put down the right kind of beneficial microbes you can help interrupt the life cycle of these bad bugs that come into your garden because most of them pupate in the soil. So how do we feed our soil food web? We put down compost, we put down worm castings, we put down mulch. Mulch is a fungal food and you want to, if you can, brew compost tea with an aerator, with a pump, or find someone in your network who actually brews professionally, brews compost tea, and buy it and apply it to your garden on a regular basis. Your soil will be happy, your plants will be happy, and they'll be able to outcompete most bugs. Let's talk about earwig damage because this one can look like a couple different things, but most of the time what you'll find is holes in the youngest, newest growth at the center of a plant, like your lettuces or Swiss chard. Earwigs love to nibble on the baby growth at the center of the plant. And those little holes that they eat into it or along the edges that they nibble away from expand as the leaf starts to grow in size. So. What I like to do is put down a bowl of olive oil, they're a bit sophisticated, bury that up to the soil level and your earwigs will go into that and die Italian. <laughs> you may need to change out that olive oil every once in a while, so don't buy your, you know, so don't use your favorite brand, get a nice cheap olive oil. Uh, they don't have that much of a discerning palate. Next up, grasshoppers. Grasshoppers will start usually eating the outer edges of a leaf and strip it all the way down to a stem, just to the, to the veins. Uh, they are most often seasonal, so they happen in early spring, and uh, sometimes there's another round of them. Grasshoppers are another one of those critters that pupate in the soil over winter. So when you, if you rough up your soil, over winter you'll disturb some of those eggs and bring them to the surface where they will desiccate and die. Keep an eye out for the babies early on and um, squash them under your mighty shoe.
Also, I want to talk to you about spider mites because they can be a little hard to identify because they're pretty much microscopic. They tend to stipple a leaf where they don't necessarily put holes in a leaf, but they do stipple it so that it looks a little bit yellow or um, greenish, lighter green. And that is usually on your herbs like thyme and oregano and mint, you'll see it. And, and this is another sucking insect that benefits from the application of worm castings because they're piercing the leaf surfaces to suck out the juices. You apply worm castings. Worm castings contain chitinase. Chitinase is taken up into the leaves and is passed on to the sucking insect as they ingest the leaf's juices. So life is good for you and not for the pest. A lot of people suggest spraying neem oil or a horticultural oil or a soap spray for sucking insects and that does work but again I always come back to two things one if you are trying to attract beneficial insects to your garden those will affect the beneficials as well as the pests so try and lay low on that secondly if you're going to spray a leaf that you're planning to eat again think twice about doing that instead resort to fortifying your soil food web and using maybe a jet blast of a, of a hose instead. If you happen to have a copy of Gardening for Geeks, you can open it up to the pest control chapter and find this super nerdy, uber helpful guide that walks you through the process of diagnosing what's eating your plants. Uh, you know, check it out. It's pretty cool. So that's inside Gardening for Geeks, which is available wherever books are sold. I'm just saying. Anyway, if you like this video, share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe and click the notification bell so that you'll find out when our next video comes online. Consider becoming a Patreon subscriber to support all the free stuff that we do here at GardenNerd.com. Happy gardening! Inside the book, in the chapter on pest control, there is this super nerdy... No glare? Glare? Wrong page. Wrong page? <laughs>